Thanks for joining us for this session. Um, and it's my absolute privilege to be here and um, share the, the stage with um, some really wonderful um, people playing in this space. And following on from an awesome number of people that have been presenting and sharing their information and their journey so far. Okay, so the title of this presentation is actually Bending the Energy System Back to Do Good. So this is a, um, a thought that Heather had to try and bring, bring the Congress back around to the, the themes of fast, fair and vital and to speak to the specific issues of justice, equity and resilience. So no small themes, I might add, to end the Congress on. <laughs> So thank you very much for, for the presenters that are going to be speaking to these um, fairly dense um, ideas. I'm both uh, the convener and a bit of a presenter too, so I'm going to just weave in a little bit of the work that I've been doing and, um, and to intersperse it with the work that each of the presenters have been doing. So hope that format works. So just to begin with, a little bit of our context, and this is very high level, of course there is many contexts around all of the work we do, but just as a high level snapshot. We've known for a really long time that renewables, sustainable energy sources are needed. So more, more in community than other places, I might say. Climate change is now banging down the door. We need to rapidly transition to renewables given decades of inaction and corporate self-interest. And in our haste, we risk leaving people and communities behind. Humans and our systems are complex and messy, and I would say much more so than they ought to be. So I love a diagram. Um, this diagram came about when we were working on the microgrid project at Venus Bay, which Alison's going to speak to us a little bit more. Um, I came up with a diagram. I didn't do the beautiful graphics. That's um, and Harrod Neil Williams' beautiful work. But this essentially speaks to well, what, what we produced this for was to try and reveal to the funders that we were seeking um, investment from for the Venus Bay microgrid project was to spell out the really important features of what is needed for a successful community energy project that is community centred and co designed with community. So community that is there at the centre. And then you need community, leading community. So Alison will speak to that um, very specifically in her presentation. But an authorised community leadership group, essentially. Um, they may need uh, support with facilitating community centred design. And that was the role I played in the Venus Bay Community Project. Partnering collaboratively is all about the multitude of partnerships that are needed in a community energy setting, and we've heard about many, many of those throughout the Congress. Analyzing and designing technical options is, is all about access to, to data, access to people who can help with designing the technical solutions that a community is looking for to meet their needs. Community wealth building is the way in which we chose to frame the economic um, financial modelling and analysis that um, was needed to produce business cases, as well as, so we chose this sort of framing, I like, if you like, because we wanted to look at economic analysis through the community wealth building lens. So just a shout out to Ethical Fields, um, a company in Australia that is specialising in community wealth building analysis and run a program called um, Place Based Capital. And they're all about trying to capture the multitude of, of economic and social uh, benefits that flow from investing in community initiatives. Um, so a really great mindset to approach um, the sort of economic and financial suite of, of things. And then crafting the enabling conditions We've all heard many times about the advocacy that's needed for better policy and better program design coming out of government. Um, but I would also say that um, crafting enabling conditions can be like the, the important features of what helps make something work stitched together at all levels. So whether it's a community level, um, the uh, local government level, state level, federal level, it's, it's got to be 
coherent across that whole system of, of governing and policy and decision making. Okay, so as Heather introduced me, um, I am the managing director of Mycelia Renewables. I'm the co one of the co-founders. We've been around since 2021, but my experience with community energy dates back to 2006. Um, when I was working with Landcare and I started looking at the farmer-owned wind energy cooperatives in Europe as a way that we could um, maybe pick up on renewable energy to help farmers reduce their emissions and um, produce renewable energy. Since then, I've um, been part of the Energy Innovation Co-op in Victoria, uh, worked with First Nations uh, groups across the state through the Federation of Victorian Traditional Owner Corporations, and then I ran the innovation, the Energy Innovation Program for the Latrobe Valley Transition Authority in Gippsland. Um, after all of that experience, I've come to the Mycelia Energy Collective, which is one of our initiatives. And, um, and I might say, as you, know, as you can tell, I love diagrams. This is not just about my journey. This is really built on the smarts and understanding of everyone that I've shared that journey with. So I like to put things together to help explain um, my own thinking, but also to enable entry points for people who are less familiar with the community energy space to be able to find touch points and entry points to understanding the richness of what community energy is about. So this is the Mycelia Energy Collective uh, model, and I'm going to go through this quickly because I think I've got one minute before I need to hand over. Um, so we do um, affordable matched energy. So we have a retail partner the Circular Energy Powered by the People's Grid is our retail partner, and we offer a retail deal that is around 25 to 30% cheaper than most other retail energy deals on the market. Um, and matched energy is all about matching the excess solar, rooftop solar at the moment, between those that have got, so households and businesses that have solar and those that don't. We do a lot around energy efficiency upgrades and we partner with um, Earthworker Cooperative who do our energy efficiency assessments and upgrades and we're concentrating our efforts around low income and vulnerable households um, who don't have their own solar and unlikely to for many reasons. And we're looking at electrification transition planning as being part of that because we see a lot of electrification projects um, getting underway, but um, by and large, they're designed for people who probably can afford to do the electrification process. So we're really aware this is once it, one more um, space where we want to make sure that the people vulnerable to being left behind aren't. Um, we weave in energy literacy into everything we do so people can make informed choices. Um, we are installing renewable energy, um, mostly on business locations, um, so entering into power purchase agreements and equipment leases with small businesses mainly, but looking at some larger businesses at the moment where we might um, do some co-location of battery and solar that can power into our collective as well as on-site use. And then, whoops, wrong way. And then ultimately we have our own community centre benefit sharing fund. And we're just... Um, uh, so there's several revenue streams going into the Community Centre Benefit Sharing Fund and uh, we're just in the process of setting up the governance group around that. So um, we're aiming for young people and elders to be on our um, Community Centre Benefit Sharing Fund. We feel like the synergy between them is wonderful. Um, one group cares eminently about the future and others want to leave a legacy um, for younger generations. So um, that's our story in a nutshell. And just uh, also a shout out to Victoria New Energy Jobs Fund, the World Wildlife Fund, Innovate to Regenerate and the Jack Brockhoff Foundation who have funded our work so far. Um, and we have loads of wonderful partners that are helping us too. Okay. Switching to the theme of energy justice. So each of the themes is going to be underpinned just by a bit of an idea and a, and a bit of a provocation. So... Um, our way of being in the world has come to be more transactional and less relational. People express feelings of disempowerment and being left behind when speaking about energy. At Mycelia, we offer a model of care that does energy differently, but this is challenging for people to imagine. So when we try and talk about a retail deal that does good, people do like a double take and think, what? <laughs> 
how can we have a retail energy deal, a relationship with our retailer that's actually also doing good in the community. So it's a bit of a challenging conversation to get started with some people. And um, we're purposely partnering with community centres and health centres that hold relationships with people already who are vulnerable to being left behind. So we can offer support through those existing relationships and networks in non-stigmatised ways. We're now going to be joined um, by Tommy and Scotty, who are going to give us um, a little bit of a, a background to their work and to speak to what energy justice means for them and the people that they're working with. So take it away. Scotty, you want to go first? Yeah, okay. Yep. Hello, good afternoon. Um, I'm Scott McDinney, and you know, as as an Indigenous fellow, Aboriginal, all the way from Northern Territory, you know, when we come to someone else's, some other tribal people country, we always introduce ourselves and acknowledge the land that we come from, uh, that we stand on, and <clears throat> I'm happy to be here on Gadigal country. Manikingana nyayanyu wa uga gula arwa. Manikingana ngana waga jajibi wa maro wan mala. Yo, paji enda maridu ya bernera moro. This, well, in Barlala we've been fighting mining companies for, since it first started mining company coming to Barlala, which is back in the 70s. <clears throat> and leading up to that, we've... We've been fighting Makata River Mine for since the 70s and coming up all the way and, you know, because I, I, I was born in the 90s and seeing my family members in front of me and fighting against mining companies and then fracking came along, hydraulic fracking, and we thought it was going to be something good, but then it turns out to be something that is really dangerous for country and culture. And I've learned a lot from my grandmother my grandmother, and he, she learned a lot from her father and her mother. My great grandmother was a Yanua woman from the Rumbadia tribe. My great grandfather is Mumbalia from the Garwa tribe. My nana is Yanua Garwa. She's a Mumbalia Wawagaria woman. And country and culture for me is very strong, and I'm passionate to keep that going. And that's my identity, that's who I am, that's my soul of where I'm from. <clears throat> and coming into looking after country and culture, we fight against mining companies and we're looking forward and moving forward into, into this new society now we're living in. So, you know, we come from me as a Yanua Garo man. Um, I'm also walking my, my, my way in life and the non-Indigenous way in life. So I walk two worlds, Kanmarayua, which is two laws in Yanua. Kujarayua in Garwa is two laws. Kujarayua in Guranji is two laws. Because we, in Barola, we made up of four different tribal groups and we all work together because we've been living in Barola ever since settlement. Colonization, but yeah, coming into the solar solar stuff now, into um, energy justice. We've um, this here is um, that on top left there. That's Wandangala outstation. That's um, that's all the power cards there. That's the prepaid meter. Usually, family members take up about two hundred, if two hundred to three hundred dollars a week, maybe just because. You know, we don't have those expensive air cons. We take those smaller ones, those box air cons, and they, they take up a lot of power in the house. And during dry season and wet season, it's pretty hot up there in the north. Um, yeah, it goes about our highest cold weather time, would, dry season time would probably be around 38, 39 degrees. And that is, that is just in dry season, even in wet season, because it's... It's the summer and it's, it goes about probably maybe highest to 40, 41. And this, 
This is um, 20 mile. Also, in our language, it's um, Dadagina or Umangalinka. That is the Mumbalia country of my grandmothers and my auntie, which is my mum's cousin. She lives out there with her partner and 12 other of, of, of my cousins, 12 of them. There's heaps of them. And there's jerry cans along the ground here. That probably fills up because diesel out there is ridiculous, you know, the, the cost of diesel out there. It's like maybe, because they got to spend, they got to, they got to keep the generator going before we chuck in these solar panels, solar power. They've, um, they've wasted, they've, they'd use about $500 weekly on just diesel, just to keep the, just to keep the generator going during the day so they could have um, the school of the year out there. So <clears throat> now we've installed the solar panels. Now they got that running 24 seven and these jerry cans here don't even, they're not even there anymore, they just did a show. Yeah, yeah. But they, they use those jerry cans to go hunting. So yeah, <laughs> fill them up and go hunting. Um, yeah, and just recently, um, there's, um, we've, we've got cut off from the main Stewart Highway because Barlow is on near Queensland border and the Carpentary Highway that goes into, goes to Stewart Highway. And it is, we're cut off right now. I was just on the phone with my uncle and they, we've cut off from Stewart Highway, so the truck with food and, and diesel to run the main generator out there is probably, I don't know when they're going to come, but hopefully the generator is going to last a bit longer out there with the fuel and the food, but yeah, we're, we're all hunters and gatherers out there, we're all right. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah, um, with that, that was, that was installed last year, and we've We've had a great time installing it and picking up and you know picking up on how electricity works and it was like I'm a quick learner I'm, I move through things quickly and that was a very good experience for me and yeah before, even before this year we went we had the opportunity to go to Wagga Wagga to do to work on that big solar farm out there with Beyond and I think Chambers were out there. So we're working with them and doing the mechanical side of things, just installing solar panels and and how the way that they work. But we didn't do the electrical side of things. That's all the sparkies. And um, yeah, but coming to this, like that was deadly. Just doing both of it, the mechanical side, installing it, and doing the electricity connection as well, and also going over to the inverter and connecting it all up to the to the batteries and then over to the generator and generating into the houses, how AC and DC works. So that was good. Um, um, yeah, and hopefully we'll move forward and keep doing it. Um, there's, there's, um, this is Wumangalinga, this is one of many of the outstation, the homelands that we were doing. And there's so many out there that even out in the, what you might call it Sir Edward Pella group, we have islands out there, but in my, my language that's Waliango Leanda Wediara, which is Yanyu Awara. And yeah, we've got like even places out there that we're gonna try and get funding to um, install solar, solar panels out there. So we've got Mulawa, we've got Wadanga, we've got Mamantamburu, and the tribal groups out there are Yanyua, and even further further east, which is on the Garwa side. And yeah, we um so looking forward to that. And, the big thing we're coming up that we're gonna do is the solar microgrid. So that's the main big one that we're gonna that I'm looking forward to on doing. And that's um, that is 2.1 megawatt um, yeah, solar array and with 3.2 megawatt batteries. So that's gonna feed into the grid and and feed it out to the family members that that are slowing down on, on you know, like, because energy out there is just too much, just run, run the, you know, the run, to run aircon, aircon. So, yeah, just like aircon and fans, that's the most reliable thing that we use all the, all the time out there. And, um, yeah, that's, so I'm looking forward to doing that microgrid and hopefully everyone gets equal power out there. And, Hold it.
Thanks, Scotty. We're going to have um, presenters um, speak to each theme and then we'll have questions at the end. So we've got quite a big chunk of time for questions at the end, so please hold them or put them into a Slido. OK, we've got um, Tommy Hicks up next from Indigenous Energy Australia. And Tommy will start by introducing himself and his work. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just made a few uh, points just so I don't get excited and miss anything. But um, first off, yeah, acknowledging country um, and, and the Gadigal country that we're on and, and the people and the culture that's, that's special in particular this, to, to particular to this place um, is really important. I made notes. This note just says, do good acknowledgement, so good start. Um, um, you think, I, I'm actually scared of heights and I had to fly to Sydney, which I absolutely hate, and you think looking out the window and looking down would make it worse, but actually being able to see, see country out the window when, you know, when you're below the clouds actually makes me feel a lot more, a lot more calm, and I think that that just kind of speaks to the relationship that we have um, um, with this place, and even listening to Scotty's story and um, how proud he is about his family and, and particularly being able to speak his um, own language fluently over his country is something that's really important and that um, not, not a lot of us have um, anymore. So, um, and I also want to acknowledge, I think, just a, just a lot of the people, uh, particularly my grandmother, that put me in, in the position that I'm in today to be able to you know, be in these types of places. She grew up on a, a German mission in, in country Western Australia and she passed away when I was 12 and I live with her most of my life and she, she taught me a lot um, about those two worlds um, very much and that if we want to get anything done we need to be able to kind of jump from one to the other seamlessly um, and I think that um, in this space it's already calling for um, non-Aboriginal people to kind of be able to jump into our world so that, that's something that I hope you guys take out of what I'm going to speak about today. Um, I have a, I'm very new, uh, very green pun intended to this industry. Um, I have a education social work background, work a little bit of in, in agriculture and food security, um, but I very much am passionate about systems design um, and systemic kind of uh, barriers and enablers to, to the things that we need as a people. Um, and I've been doing that across the education and, and social space, um, working for KWI Aboriginal Corporation um, over the last two years as a project officer, doing some service uh, design um, to, I guess, distill all these crazy funding agreements and have have the, the families that need the help um, feel confident in what it is and, and um, see that it's transparent. Because uh, one thing that we, we say in that industry is they really just don't, really don't care about what your funding agreement says. They, they kind of just um, are at a place either they're not even ready for support or, um, uh, yeah, they don't really understand um, a lot of the government rigmarole. So just trying to put that in, in plain language and um, help them buy into it. and. I guess we look at our service delivery and I'm looking at these projects in a very similar light as, as a bit of an A to B and I think uh, the industry right now is really discounting what it takes to get people to A, when, you know, in the, in, the, in the human services space coming in and saying, hey, I'm here, I've got a problem, I'm ready for your help. Um, we're, we're making a few assumptions that, that a lot of these communities are going to be like, hey, we're here, we want to do work with you on renewable energy projects. Because um, there's no relationship, they don't really have an understanding of the industry. It's it's quite complicated, even for me. Um, I tried. I put a put a ban on acronyms for the first two week at, two weeks at IEA, so I could um, start soaking it up. Um, but I think that's just the dimension that that this industry is missing at the moment is that that um, social social socio cultural dimension. And I I don't I think it's pretty far out of left field to say if you're a renewable company, maybe go hire like a project manager from a social space and and let them um, kind of bring some structure to um, social and, and economic outcomes with, with with the communities that you're trying to work with. Um, I think that that would work. Um, but first, before before you do that, I guess. I guess um, a just transition would mean developing a bit of a vision of that justice and, and what it means to you, um, not just as an organisation, but as a people. Um, and working with community, because working with communities is innately social, I think. Like we're having issues with food, power, and water. Like, um, you know, it's hard to think about jobs <laughs> when those types of things are going on in these places. Um, and, then, and then recruiting local people is the best, or better yet, um, 
engaging engaging local organisations and helping the opportunity build their capacity for other things and not only just offering them an opportunity to work um, and be paid to do work, but also uh, some of the learning and, and that capacity stuff that you can pass on from your, your organisation would be a great start. Um, and then how do we kind of re support the retention of those relationships um, through, th through valuing um, in, a, in a monetary way the lived and cultural experience that you're asking us to leverage in our communities? Because um, if things go bad and, and you know, we're kind of partnered with you, I answer for it at, at the football club and at my auntie's house at dinner and, and all those types of things. So that poses a huge sometimes barrier or reluctance for us to want to be engaged in this work. Um, and underpinning it with with an understanding of closing the gap, because at the end of the day, those are the big ticket items that we're trying to that we're trying to think. It's hard to work towards jobs. You know, when I was born, the the, the life expectancy gap from from my area was still 8.6 years. So, and I grew up in the southern suburbs of Metro Adelaide. So, um, yeah, pretty interesting um, when people don't really have that understanding yet. Yet we come to communities. Um, but how are relationships important to the work that I do? I mean, relationships. Culture is relationships. It's relationships with myself. It's relationships with community. Um, it's relationships with country. And um, if you're going to come onto country or whether it's in a metro, regional or remote area, um, how are you going to develop in, in, I guess we call it show and face to, to community, but also to country itself? Because that's what we want to um, understand is, is protected and, and is going to be supported going forward. Um, and, and in turn, culture. So, so these types of projects are going to be a means to a bit of a different end. Um, and just understanding that, that KPI from community's perspective around those, those socio-cultural and, and health outcomes, really. So, um, yeah, I just thought I'd give you a bit of my insights about, I think, what will make these, this, this work successful. So if you want to yell me after, I'm more than happy to speak a bit more. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tommy. All right, on to energy equity. So the energy market is not cherished for the wider community benefit it delivers yet. Leveraging benefits and enabling equity are challenging and not enough people are acting in this space. At Mycelia in the Energy Collective, our members make a weekly contribution. So households contribute a dollar a week and businesses contribute $3 a week. That's one of the revenue streams that go into our benefit sharing fund. And based on member feedback, we're seen to offer a pay it forward feed in tariff option. So people have been asked if they would consider paying forward their feed in tariff, and we've had enough people indicating that they would. So that feed in tariff, um, they um, are opting to forgo and have it put straight into the benefit sharing fund, which can be another way of distributing wealth. To speak to the energy equity theme, we're going to be joined by Colin Lambie from Bendigo Sustainability Group and Nigel Hancock from Pingala. Thank you, Nigel and Colin. <laughs> um, and they're going to be speaking to the how are you or your organisation supporting equity in the energy space and what benefits have you been able to share with your communities? Thanks, Colin. Thank you. Uh, I want to start by uh, disagreeing with one of the statements that was put up earlier on, which was about risk of leaving people behind. It's, that's, that's wrong. It's, just, it's not a risk, it's a fact. We have left people behind. And what I'm going to talk about is some of the things that we've done to cater for some of those people that have been left behind. So the, on the left is um, a set of social housing homes in Bendigo. Uh, we did crowdfunding. So we just went to the community uh, asking for donations. So this is one of the significant points. There's people out there wanting to donate. There's an appetite to donate to projects like this. So, you know, it, it, it's not hard. It's not rocket science. Um, people with social media skills make it easier. And uh, so basically, we get a donation. We usually have a few lined up. Get a donation, take a photo, post it on Facebook. Other people see it. Oh, I'll donate to that. And then it's just the same thing over and over again. So that was $30,000. To, um, for the people in those social housing homes to save electricity. Now, between that project and this one, I'll talk a bit more about, we did two other projects. One was uh, we got a grant from Victorian Government to do energy efficiency audits of 15 homes 
and we had a small budget, $500 per home, to do small energy efficiency upgrades. So that was like draft stoppers, that sort of thing, to make their homes more energy efficient and obviously save on energy. At the same time we were doing that, we did crowdfunding to put solar on 15 homes. These were owner-occupied homes and they were almost exclusively recent refugees, mostly Karen people. And, and it was interesting, some of the cultural issues that we had to deal with, obviously language was a big problem, but we also partnered with the uh, local community health service who deal with these people and, and they have the translators, etc. But one of the things which is really interesting, if you know, Korean people from Myanmar where they've been treated badly by people in uniforms, you get the solar companies turn up with a uniform, in effect, and, and that was a problem. But, but anyway, we've got the 15 homes done, we're very proud of that. This is our current project. Again, it's crowdfunding to put solar on low-income homes and, and it was 30 um, homes this time. It's, we actually have less trouble raising the money than finding the homes where we want to put the solar. It's a gift, but you know all that marketing that's out there, free solar, free this, free that. Therefore, it's very hard when we're saying it's free when you know, they're so used to saying it's free and it's not. So that was a, that was a problem for us. But anyway, that's been our couple of ways of um, catering for those people who are being left out. And we've done other big projects where we've, as we speak, we're um, doing two 100 kilowatt projects on nursing homes. We've done various power purchase agreements, put solar on council buildings, some businesses, and uh, so and, and bulk buys of solar, small battery projects. Um, that that's our seventh crowdfunding project, and and we've we've been lucky with this one. We got a grant to pay the people to do the organising, but the first two. <coughs> The first two, excuse me, were um, done by volunteers. So it's, it is something that's possible to do with volunteers. So thank you. Thanks very much, Colin. I'll hand over to Nigel. Uh, thank you, everyone. Isn't it been a great couple of days? Um, I'm a bit disappointed that it's coming to an end, but I hope everyone's going tomorrow. I can't make it, but um, I encourage you all to go. I live up near the central coast, near Narara. Um, it's a lovely part of the world. Um, though Pingala itself is based around Sydney, though we've sort of expanded a bit beyond that. And we've really focused on the idea of um, equity, and I'm sure everyone knows the difference between equality and equity. And um, we base it around this idea of energy, energy citizenship, That's the, that everyone is involved in the energy sector. And we've sort of broken it up a little bit into this idea of solar for businesses, um, because there are a lot of everyday people who run SMEs and businesses that need support, and we want the communities to be involved with that. So uh, projects like the Young Henry's project, the Four Pines project um, in collaboration with Clear Sky Solar and the Sydney Buddhist Centre, these are all uh, solar for businesses where people are putting money in and getting, uh, getting involved in the energy sector. So, uh, but that necessarily wasn't everyone. We reduced the barriers of entry as much as possible but there's still a lot of people that, we, that are locked out of the energy system. They could get involved um, for multiple reasons. And then we partnered and we're working with um, CPA and others on the Haystack Solar Garden Project, another way for people to get involved. And what we found was really that um, while money and finances were involved in a lot of these decisions, everyone was getting involved for different reasons. Um, it might be altruistic, it might be supportive, it might be excitement about the future, or it might be um, concerns about climate change and all the rest. And we really thought about the question of like, what is going on? And we've come sort of to the conclusion that um, despite the question of how quickly it's happening, the energy transition is happening. And the question for us now, is it going to be fair? So, um, Recently, we got the opportunity to look at solar for social housing, and I think this statement from uh, Solar Citizens really sort of 
drives home that there is a group of people left behind and locked out. Um, and looked at sort of, okay, how, how can we deliver benefit to people in social housing? Um, and we, like, we're, a lot of us are aiming for that pinnacle. Let's, let's save bills, let's provide financial resources back to these people so they can get involved in things, they don't have to worry about where the money's coming from. But you also need this foundation of indirect benefits and outcomes as well. So has anyone tried to build a pyramid without a foundation? You, you, I tried to get the animation to work, but it doesn't matter what pathway you take to the top, you need to go and supply these indirect benefits as well. And these are the why. That's the, that's the goal, we want to do that. But delivering through these indirect benefits is really makes people feel more like energy citizens as opposed to just a participant in the financial market. So yeah, that's my definition of equity. All right, to our last theme um, around resilience. So if we're fortunate enough, we live in communities where leaders have stepped up to fill the void of the years of inaction, to show us what's possible to facilitate change and to strengthen resilience along the way. At Mycelia, we co-design with communities. We're all about enabling self-determined energy transitions and strengthening resilience as a key component of that. And we're partnering with Regen Labs to develop a readiness tool to enable bespoke support processes for communities that are wishing to undertake community energy initiatives but don't know where to start, don't even know the questions to ask and, and need um, you know, some tools and, and um, support information along the way. To join us to speak to the resilience theme, uh, we have Alison Skinner from Venus Bay. We have Karina Donkers from the Geelong Sustainability speaking to the Climate Safe Homes and Juliet Milbank from to Totally Renewable Yakandanda. Alison, would you like to join us first? <laughs> speaking to the questions, what does resilience look like in your community and how does resilience relate to energy? Oh, we'll go there. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it looks like in our community, is all those people gathered together in a time of um, storm and power outage with no water, no toilets, no communication, um, no petrol in a small regional um, town, one road in and out, sort of a little, small coastal um, community, and... Um, uh, yeah, when I was asked what does it look like, I just thought, oh, there we are. That is exactly what it looked like. Um, so just briefly, my name's Alison Skinner. I manage the Venus Bay Community Centre, which is one of 400-odd neighbourhood houses in Victoria. So we do get a little bit of money from the Victorian State Government to pay me to coordinate um, all sorts of community development and community sort of determined programs, activities, events that meet the needs of the local community. So boom and bust coastal um, area, um, ageing demographic, whole pile of new people coming in during COVID as well. Um, and we started our energy journey about four or five years ago uh, when we met Heather Smith and invited her to come to Venus Bay to help talk to us about, or our, broadly our community, what, what is community energy? What could it look like for us? And so that was the start of an engagement process which has been absolutely critical um, in the journey we've had to date and where we're going to from here. So um, as part of that, you know, we've talked in this, you know, there's been so many amazing, inspiring stories, big projects, small projects. We're on the very sort of grassroots kind of level of the, of the project. But um, we started with... a. Um, creating a, a microgrid, a, a standalone islandable um, system at the community centre. 
increasing our, um, our solar capacity, putting in a significant battery and a backup generator, diesel generator, I have to say, um, so that when we have no power in our community, people can come there, they can feel safe, they can be connected, they can seek information, they can put food in our fridge, they can cook dinner, they can go to the toilet, they can get water. Um, and as part of that, which, uh, you know, we did need some funds from uh, Victorian State Government, um, Sustainability Victoria and Gippsland Climate Change Network. Um, but that system cost us probably about seventy-five or $80,000, which isn't much. And it's actually this amazing blueprint of community resilience that is good to go. And, like, here is how we did it. Here's how you in your small community across, you know, all these little regional towns could get together and we could have this amazing patchwork of um, these sort of resilience hubs, a bit like the heat wave um, ones that we talked about yesterday. Haven. Sorry, heat havens. Heat havens yesterday. Um, anyway, so as part of that, and it's the little things that then see the next part of the project, we did manage to get some funding critical um, from the Australian Government to do a feasibility study of um, reliable energy and um, community resilience and that's when we um, worked, started more formally working with Dr Morag Mackay and Heather Smith and our other partners and that co-design in the community-led angle of that feasibility study was um, the critical part of it. Communities felt like it was a bottom-up study. It was what does this community know and understand about um, energy and what you know what that looks like because, as we've heard, very confusing space. We had the amazing technical expertise that Heather could bring and make it real. Um, and we moved slowly with the journey that Morag could coordinate that co-design. So we brought people along the way. And one of the, um, uh, so, we, you know, we did that study and we, together, as a community, we made this kind of plan for the future. Um, and that's the, our next challenge is how we're actually going to implement that plan. But part of it is the patchwork of household, which, uh, as we've heard, is probably the low-hanging fruit, something we might be able to act on. The community groups and um, community buildings, rec reserves, et cetera, the local businesses, Sort of clusters and then ideally the whole community so that we can be self-determinedly resilient in our community but I want to just when we talk about resilience one of the first workshops we did uh, um, was mapped our resilience the community's idea of their own resilience so we had this kind of basically a mud map that was the two sort of areas of road in between that gets flooded gets cut off um, etc and so the community really acknowledged their own existing resilience. When you live in regional areas, you know, you're used to sort of power outages and various other things. You know, I think, um, yeah, you know, a bit like what you were saying, you know, we're, we can sort ourselves out to a point. But that gave, it was a reminder of the community's own sort of, agency in, in the resilient space and so we were then able to kind of keep working on that and build on that. Um, so we ended up with a plan, then once we had that little bit of success we then have started another pilot project which I think is supposed to be the first one in Australia using an electric minibus to undertake a community transport pilot project which has just started and actually was launched yesterday in the hub that uh, the virtual hub in Lee and Gatha, you know, ribbon cutting, etc., with the buses. And you'll see, you know, this, you know, image and logo everywhere, community energy. Um, so I think I was only allowed to speak for one minute and I've gone beyond <laughs> that. But um, I do want to just mention our use of the words community energy because I think that's probably within even this room, I think there's a few different definitions of that and I really personally loved, um, was it Stefan, the very first day, who had that definition which is about communities being involved, community members, which are a connected group of people, being involved in the determination, the 
ownership and the benefits of it. Um, and I think we need to keep reminding ourselves of that language when we say community energy and what that is, because it is a bit of a confusing space. Anyway, thank you. Thank you very much, Alison. Okay, um, we'll go back one slide to um, Juliet Milbank from Taylor Renewable Yakandanda. Thanks, Morag. Um, I'm here today because our president, Matt Charles-Jones, unfortunately came down with COVID a couple of days before the Congress. So, um, and this has very much been prepared on the fly um, in about 10 minutes earlier this afternoon. So I, I will do my best. Um, but this is a project that I'm also quite passionate about. And to address your starting question, Morag, um, about what does resilience look like in our community. Um, TRI started in 2014 from a very committed group of locals who were tired of the inaction at the federal level or the lack of policy and decided they wanted to do something. And the question they asked themselves was, what does it look like if we do energy differently? Because they wanted to take action and address some of the climate um, change that was happening to reduce emissions, but they could also see that using renewables actually brought with it a whole host of other benefits. And that has been really the focus the whole way along, um, is every single project looks at what benefits does this bring to our town, to our community? And in the start, that was focused around, the, the goal was 100% renewables by originally 2022. It's shifted a bit now. Um, but over the years, it's migrated a bit and we're now much more concentrated on resilience. And so, and just to go back to the original question, what does resilience look like in our community? Well, small regional town, uh, mixture of sort of agricultural, originally forestry and dairy industries, but close to the nearest Albury Wodonga, which is the largest community um, combined of like 90, 100,000 people. So you get a lot of the sort of more urban people living in Yak and Danda because they can commute. So it's a really diverse community. And it's also a community that already had a fair measure of resilience in that when the local petrol station closed in about 2000, some locals got together because they realised how dire that would be for a small community because all of a sudden people would be driving out of the community to get their petrol and the closest would be about 20 minutes down the road, which would then mean that people would also shop out of the community. And all of a sudden you have this, this income um, and the social connections and everything tending to migrate away from the town. So they bought the local petrol station and they got that going and that petrol station now makes a good profit and feeds funds and grants into other local community groups. So those social connections and resilience, that is resilient for a country town, is retaining local services, retaining local funds. And when TRI started our projects, one of the things that we saw was that renewables could help some of the local community, community groups and organisations, and initially it was the CFA. We were putting batteries and solar panels on various um, community buildings, and we decided to do the CFA as well. Um, and at that stage, there were no solar systems on any fire stations in Victoria, and it took us five years. Even though we were providing the funding, we'd done all the scoping, we'd done the feasibility, it took us five years to convince the CFA and get it through the systems and get it on top of the fire station roof. But once we did, then um, they suddenly decided it might be a good idea to do it on a few other fire stations. And they've since rolled out a program across the stations in Victoria. But what that meant was that when a fire happens, and Yakandanda has been threatened by serious bushfires about three times in the last sort of 18 years, and was a major staging po post during the Black Summer bushfires in 2019, 2020, um, we had lots of the crews fighting the fires in the Upper Murray staged in our town. What that meant was if there was a power cut, the fire station could still operate. 
its communications could still operate, the firefighters could come back, they still had air conditioning because obviously fighting fires in hot weather is really tough on your body, so you need a cool place to recuperate. And it meant the fridge would still be running with food and cold water. And that was the start of our, our shift in slightly in our focus of concentrating on resilience. And since then, we've put, um, uh, we've also installed a backup generator at the CFA. We've put a solar and battery system and a generator on the SES. And our latest project, which is funded by um, Emergency Recovery of Victoria, has added extra solar and battery systems to several pub, um, of our community buildings, including the public hall, the local school, the community centre, um, and a few of them all now have plug-in points for mobile generators, and we've purchased two mobile generators. Um, the deployment of those generators is the decision of the local incident management crew, so it's not taken just by somebody at one of those facilities. It's a, it's a strategic and structured decision-making process, so it's only used in the appropriate circumstances. And because those generators are mobile, they can be moved wherever they're needed, and we're happy to lend them to other local towns in the region as well. And as well as that, as part of the project, we also uh, formed a community reference committee. We participated in a, a Ready Red Cross um, sort of program looking at resilient structures in towns. And they actually looked at what do the local governance structures need to better deal with emergencies. Um, so it was really a, a real holistic view about how could Yak and Dander make itself more resilient when unexpected or uh, extreme things happen, and it could be um, it could be a an extreme weather event, or it could be a bushfire, it could be whatever. But there are now s systems in place and infrastructure in place that we can now call into action when we need to. And for the local people, that means an awful lot because regional community, anybody outside of town, uh, a lot of them, uh, especially if there's a bushfire and your power goes out, they rely on water pumps to protect their properties. Some of them rely on water pumps generally just to um, get their water. And so knowing that, that you've got systems in place that can still operate the essential services in town is really important. And our public hall can act as a relief centre and we're currently in the process of putting a community battery on our sports and recreation uh, building which will have a grid firming inverter and will be able to also keep running if the main grid goes down. So that's what resilience is looking like in Nyack. Um, and that's, I guess, sort of indirectly, that's how it relates to energy for us because it means you can still operate. And in extreme conditions and in emergencies, you want to be able to operate. You don't want to have to rely on all these outside agencies to come in. Um, yeah, that, that's... It's really important. Just picking up on that last point too, we, um, um, Jan, in our area, we're developing up a, a region-wide, or sorry, a shire-wide resilience project with our local government. And um, the fellow from local government said the advice that they're giving to isolated communities is to not expect external help to come in within 72 hours. So really clear message from Juliet that um, what it looks like for a community to be able to withstand that lack of support. Okay, last presenter. Karina from Geelong Sustainability, speaking on climate safe homes. Thank you. It's been great to hear about the amazing projects that everyone is running. I feel continuously inspired by our community and what we offer. Um, we've been doing a lot in the resilience space. We actually just about two weeks ago ran a climate community resilience forum with 70 people, which was really fantastic and a great way to start this conversation in a broader context with people. But 
What I was asked to speak to today is around our Climate Safe Rooms project, um, which was a really fantastic pilot project that was run. I personally wasn't working on the project, but I get to be up here presenting about the amazing work that Geelong Sustainability has been doing. So they, um, around the resilience piece um, for our community, but also the equity piece and the justice piece, we are really aware that, as has been, been spoken about before, that a lot of people are being left behind. Um, and when it comes to things like the Electric Homes Program, as amazing as that program is, there is a requirement of a certain capacity to be able to participate um, financially. And so the Climate Safe Rooms, I feel like, is a great example of filling one of those um, gaps around the inequitable impacts of this um, transition. And that's a concept that was developed by Tim Adams, who was one of our committee members um, previously. And he came up with this concept of, instead of transitioning the entire home, which can be quite costly, quite expensive, quite challenging, um, looking at what would happen if we created one climate safe room within a house. A household um, and so the, this was a pilot project that was run out um, for 16 homeowner um, household uh, households and it was for people who had um, were in the low income bracket but also had a chronic illness so um, and had someone coming into their homes for care reasons around their chronic illness and so that was the criteria for the people who participated in this program. And the reason that that was it is because they're some of our most vulnerable uh, community groups. And when it comes to the heat waves and the cold, I'm from Victoria, so the cold that we experience as well, actually um, is one of the population groups that we experience um, high death rates in those heat waves or those the cold alongside health issues, complex health issues. And so it's a really important group that we need to make sure doesn't be left behind. And so the program went in and um, worked with these homeowners, did, did assessments, um, and then looked at what was the room that they're using the most. So often a lounge room and dining, whatever it is, the place that you were in the most and made that room as climate safe as possible. And they did that through making sure the envelope of the room was um, better through draft proofing, insulation, things like that. And then there was installation of reverse split system fit for that size of the room and um, to for the heating and cooling means. And then there was an installation of a small solar system that helped to um, offset the costs of um, that system running. And so what we'd found with this population group was that often they were either being financially hit by heating and cooling their their, their homes um, and not trying not being able to maintain that, or they were sacrificing their health and not putting on their, their heating and cooling um, because they were living in poor quality homes um, and that was impacting their health, In but it was saving their finances. So this is where the Climate Safe Room concept came in and it was a project where we did a lot of um, uh, research and um, into the comfort of the homes, into the impact on the individuals and the family members of that home um, after this transition. And it was, the outcomes were fantastic around mental health and wellbeing went up, um, people, their uh, visits to the doctors and healthcare went down, their savings was humongous. Um, the average was around 1,400 um, per home household of savings and um, that was a considerable amount of money, particularly for low um, income households. And, um, it, it, it allowed for these these home these rooms to maintain this stable uh, temperature throughout the year, and the benefits have been considerable. And we had temperature and humidity monitoring devices in there that were non-invasive that tracked that. So we really got this incredible detail about um, the how the room temperature varied and the benefits and the differences from this um, intervention of the climate safe rooms. So. It was a really fantastic pilot and now we're looking at, and these were some of our 
amazing partners that helped that to happen. And now we're looking at trying to scale that up to a larger amount of households, you know, 100, 1,000 in our region, um, and we want this to be rolled out around Australia. We think it's a really important um, and achievable uh, space for supporting these these households in the ideal world we would outfit the whole house um, however cost wise it is really challenging and so that's where the climate safe rooms is an affordable option um, that really supports people financially mental health wise um, uh, health wise and also <coughs> saves on emissions and brings them along with this transition so that's what I was sharing about today. Happy to answer any questions later. Okay, could we have all the presenters up the front? Thank you. Can I start with the first question, do you mind? Yes, please. Um, I, I just have a question for the, for the First Nations people. How could we train up some First Nations people to be electricians and solar installers? Because there seems to be a real need out there for both for electricians and for solar installers. So how could we actually work that up? Can you hear me? Push the green, push button. Yeah, um, you know, the thing with us is that we don't leave the community and it's hard for us to leave. So if there's any way we're gonna learn or, you know, like there's, with me, I went to Darwin for schooling, boarding school. And, and I've learned so many things that I've, you know, and coming up over the years, I've known how to, how to get my way around and, and work with non-Indigenous. And, you know, that's something for me, like, from my, my point of view. But, you know, I could, I could take this experience back to my homeland and even, even in other communities as well, because I've worked, I've worked as a, as like a Sparky's TA. I've, I've worked as a, as a carpentry TA, like a <coughs> trader's assistant. And that's, for me, I'm going into communities, like they, they, we just need that push. And that's when I go out, because I've been working, you know, I've, I've been in the mines, I've done all those stuff, and, and. Just, just for people like, like family, countrymen like us, we just need that push, and I'm, I'm happy to do that, and I'd love to do that. Just, that's all we need, just that push, and then, you know, we, we could be able to run our own community. Any more questions? Tom, Tommy, did you want to add? Oh, yeah, I guess, I guess when it comes to any ed education, um, just making sure that the support's responsive, I think. Um, we see a lot of success with setting up um, appropriate mentorship um, to, to walk alongside people um, as peers and, and also people um, in management as well um, for young people going through their trades. And, and yeah, just like Scotty said, young, young fellas don't really want to leave home. So it's also about um, helping them understand how they might bring their trade back to their community and, and some of the applications of their trade um, help them train in a way that's, that feels like home almost, you know what I mean, um, and, and see the value because I think a lot of them, to, to leave home, they're not just going to do that for a pay packet. Um, they they want to be able to do that to bring something back to, to help, help the old people and the young people that we're, we're responsible to. Awesome. Uh, question for Colin. Colin, um, I love the idea of crowdfunding. Um, how do you persuade people it's not a scam, though? <laughs> Uh, well, Bendigo Sustainability Group started in 2007 and, and it's trust. Um, you know, the reason they come to us for advice all the time about solar and batteries and other things is because they trust us. And uh, so I don't think there was any issues with that. There, there was some uh, issue with regard to instead of donating for a sports stadium or we raised money for solar on the library and, and we did some other projects. But when it came to uh, solar that was going to benefit individuals, there was some negative negativity about that, but we still got all the money within a couple of months. Do you think it'll dry up at some point? The, the generosity? Yes. No, no, I'd imagine humanity will continue and... Um... <laughs> 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 
<laughs> nice. Nice, hopeful vision for the future. <laughs> um, my question's for Karina. Um, so I'm about to launch, I think next week it will be launching a very similar heat resilience room project um, in uh, LGI I'm working in. I was just wondering on your project, is the resident themselves funding that aircon installation or is that being funded? Sorry if I missed it during your talk, but who's I think, I think I missed that, so sorry about that. Um, yeah, so th th that was fully free. The, the whole installation and everything was um, provided to them um, as part of this pilot project um, because they, they don't have the capacity to be able to make those changes themselves. Yeah, so that was um, through the funding that we received and that's what we're also advocating for through politicians, um, especially leading up to elections, is for them to make... Um, financial commitments to uh, potentially a, a, a flow on for the climate safe rooms. Yeah. Can I just um, grab you while you're there? There's another question for you, Karina. Um, what is the average cost of a climate safe room? Yeah, so the average that um, for the homes that we've done, and I, don't, I, I, I wonder whether that would also decline um, more the larger amounts of homes that you're doing. But with the 16 that we did, it was around, on average, about 7,300 um, per, 7,400 per home um, for those installations and those changes. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Oh, so he um, asked around the projected um, costs of savings from health and um, uh, and bills and in emergency services. Uh, there was some um, look into the impact. So they had around, which I think I mentioned, uh, an average of around 1,460 or something per person savings on energy and health. So like health appointments, doctor's appointments and things like that. And so um, the, I get this, the prediction over that time of, you know, a five year, the the payback is quite considerable um, and, and beneficial for the, the whole system as well, you know, and so it is a really great um, advocacy tool, um, the savings on the healthcare system as well as the benefits for the individual and for the, the justice piece, yeah. Okay, with... Hi, yeah. uh, Ken Ash. Um, got a question about social housing and feed-in tariffs uh, for the panel, and I'm not sure if anyone, maybe it's a general question, um, is anyone aware of any trials or any feed-in tariffs where the, the PV system, say, for instance, can be installed on social housing? The tenant gets the benefit of self-consumption, but the owner gets the benefit of the feed-in tariff, so, the, so there's a split tariff arrangement. It's something that I'm investigating for some microgrid projects we're working on, but I don't know if any arrangement exists anywhere in any of the projects or... Any of the other states? Thanks. Uh, the, the project that we did was unusual in that the eight uh, little homes uh, were all on one metre and it was the social housing homes organisation that paid the electricity bill. But we worked out what the savings were going to be and they uh, reduced the rent accordingly. So it would have been the social housing home organisation getting the feeding tariff, but they were passing it on. I, I did uh, work on another project where we put solar, small solar systems on um, what was going to be 60, ended up being 30 social housing homes. Because the occupant pays the electricity bill, assuming the paperwork is done by the installer and um, the supplier, retailer, etc., then the occupant gets the feed-in tariff. So they get the full benefit of that. Unfortunately, the paperwork doesn't always get done and therefore the occupant doesn't actually get the benefit. Yeah, I might just add to that because... Um, our social housing project, we're right in the middle of site identification. So one of these questions has come up actually on one of the sites as well. And it really depends on how the, the site is structured. So like in Gavin's example, there's one single connection for all um, participants. It's very easy to say, yep, yeah, okay, you guys get the savings, you guys get the uh, feed-in tariff. Um, when it's 
when it's individually metered, um, there's only a few technical solutions to be able to do that. Um, Alum Solar Shares, the one we're investigating at the moment, and that's not quite clear cut. You can't say specifically these meters um, are self consumption, these meters are receiving the feed in tariff. It'd kind of actually be easier dealing with social housing providers if that's what you could do because there's a benefit for social housing, housing providers to actually do this. Um, otherwise, there's very little um, incentives for them. But uh, yeah, there is a bit of a workaround with the Illum SolShare system, so I can talk to you about that. But um, yeah, it's unfortunately when they're individually metered, you, you do need to be quite creative and, um, and work on a site-by-site -site basis. All right. I've got a couple of questions here on Slido. Um, uh, First one there, I think, was answered by Karina. The, how much did the Climate Safe Room upgrade cost? Or around seven and a half thousand. Yep. Um, I often find that people who complain about their bills haven't been, um, haven't even used Energy Made Easy to download meter data and find the best plan. Should this be done first? I, and in Victoria, it's um, Energy Compare. Um, so, anyone want to speak to? Encouraging people to look for the best hunt for the best deal. They are allowed to get any kind of other mm. assistance. Is that what should mm -hmm. it be done firstly? Um, before anything else, I think. Before anything else, yeah. Surely. The the um, in, in Victoria, it, everyone has a smart meter, so um, we're able to download the smart meter data. This is something I've been doing for years routinely. So we can we can calculate the uh, the savings, potential savings of various size solar systems based on their past usage patterns, so going back 12 months, and, and, and the orientation of their roof, etc. And we, we can do that within a, like a dollar. That's, that's how accurate it is. And um, so, but, but it's obviously different when there is, isn't smart meters and smart meter data. Um, but yeah, so Victoria's at least something they're advanced at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyone else to speak to that? Yeah. Um, I guess the, the thing that I would um, add to that um, is that I think we take it for granted that this is our language and this is like we've become quite well versed in what this means and the pieces, the steps, that kind of thing. But for the majority of our population, it's super foreign. I remember when, before I stepped into this industry, like I didn't even know that I had, a, like how the meter worked or like anything about that or that. I could even interact in some form. And so I think a lot of it comes back to the education piece and breaking down the barriers of, and, and stepping out like someone is so brand new, like you would a child, but in a respectful way, because it is, it is a foreign piece for most people. And I think we can't assume that they would know that is the first step. I think that's um, a, a, an assumption in itself, yeah. Yeah, uh, actually, I just want to reinforce that <laughs> a little bit. But also, our experience is more with um, small and medium enterprises. And um, with installing a solar system, that can actually fundamentally change their energy profile to the point where a tariff before solar isn't actually the right tariff anymore after solar. So it's a continual process. And actually, like that's the idea of a lot of our um, reta energy retailing regulation is that it should be a continual process. People don't do it like that, but we should be reviewing it all the time. And that's what I that's what I encourage our sites to do is have a look at it now, have a look at it after, have a look at it in six and twelve months because it'll change. Thank you. Any more questions from the floor? No. All right. <laughs> I wonder if I might uh... Thanks, everyone. Um, I uh, am not actually going to ask a question, which is really naughty. But um, <laughs> I, I um, had hoped to get Karina to talk about their... Um, landlord tenant uh, uh, project and um, one of the models that they've done where the um, the tenant pays um, 26 cents for their solar 
uh, 40 cents for their uh, normal electricity, but they get a little indicator and after eight years they've paid off their solar. So um, the, the housing provider can offer that um, to... Uh, offer them free solar after that. Um, so, so I think we have to keep experimenting in this in this space. So, um, yeah, I just thought I'd like to encourage everyone to keep experimenting. Mm. She did talk about that yesterday, didn't she? Mm. Just correct. No. Yes. All right. I think we're just about to the end of the congress, the end of this session. Um, could we have just one last idea um, or inspiring thought or even challenge from each of the panel members? What, what's one last piece you'd like to send everyone home with? I'd like to just say we've heard so You need the microphone? Mm -hmm. I'm loud enough. Um, I'd like to say uh, we've heard such great stories, big and small. We've met wonderful people and passionate um, you know, volunteers and practitioners. And um, I think let's start joining the dots a bit better and looking at, you know, um, one pilot that's, that could replicate and then I've, we've just heard another pilot, the exact same pilot. And that's not disrespect. So let's look at what we've already achieved and build on that. And I think we could get better at doing that because then we can scale or play in that bigger space if we work together. Because, look, I can't work any bigger than what I'm doing, but we've, there's a lot of versions of me or, or our circumstance. So, yeah, collaborate and work together to join the dots because yeah, I think that's important. <laughs> I put the same thing in another way. If I hear someone else's idea I like, I'll steal it. Um, <laughs> maybe I should say borrow. But certainly um, a lot of what we have done, or what the sustainability group has done, has been based on other people's ideas. Sometimes, um, and certainly when we put, did the crowdfunding with solar on the library, a council building, but we borrowed that idea from two other groups that were trying to do it with their councils and never managed to do it. We had cooperative people at the council at the time and we managed to do it. Uh, I guess my last thought uh, in the work that I do um, is really letting go of zero-sum thinking because there's a lot of, um, between, between community and, and generally government and industry, that a win for one is a loss for the other, whereas there's just some huge mutual wins, wins to be had. And I talk about this with, with my mob quite a lot, uh, try and combat some of that generational uh, kind of mistrust uh, is just to, just to understand the opportunity that's in front of us and um, that it's not just for the warm and fuzzies. Um, Effective community engagement and co-design is actually the most beneficial thing for your bottom line. Local labour, best labour, there's people that know the community. Um, it's, it's really, yeah, letting go of that, that zero-sum thinking. Awesome. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to agree with everything everybody else has said. I think um, collaboration is so important because we are all volunteer groups. There's no point in each group reinventing the wheel in their particular place and context. So absolutely collaboration and collaboration on a bigger scale too because it can't just be community doing it. It also has to be government and it also has to be business. So if I can encourage anything, it's to keep up the conversations. Even if your local council isn't particularly receptive, just tell them what you're doing anyway. <laughs> Still keep going and knocking on the door and regularly <coughs> updating them and seeing if you can get a response because we need to bring everybody along and um, as much as possible, you just keep up those conversations. Great. Um, yes, 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 yes. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, when it comes to community, like connecting into these amazing networks, like we have community bases and connections are everywhere, whether that's sporting clubs or churches or what have you. There is these amazing networks of people that we can um, walk alongside and they really encourage us. And just also a reminder of, you know, asking the question of like, who's not at our table? Like who is not part of this discussion? Um, just to make sure that we bring that, that justice and equity piece along with this. Um, so, yeah, who do we need to actually 
have alongside us in those conversation who, who's currently not? And that's a really important question that I have to constantly ask myself to check my own privilege and our own stance in Geelong sustainability. So, oh. <laughs> nope, I've got mine. Um, so I'm gonna take two points. The first is take care of yourselves. Um, you can't do it if you're not feeling well or something, so please take care of yourselves. But also that um, when Pingala started in 2013, the idea of what a community energy project was was very narrow. What it could achieve was very narrow. And we hear every single Congress and every time there's one of these events that that's always being pushed out in different directions for different reasons. For all the reasons that people, and I'm sure that Scotty will give, these we can solve problems that today we don't see a solution for. So, yeah, keep pushing the boundaries, take care of yourselves. Bring it home, Scotty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, firstly, I'd like to say thanks for having us. Um, you know, it's a big journey coming from the bush into the city. Um, but I've been here so many times before, but you know, um, it's good to come up here and, you know, and share what I've brought from the bush. And um, yeah, this is something that I will take back home and I will, and I will tell my younger cousins, brothers, you know, that, um, that what I've ha experienced here over the last two days. And thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, who's just been part of this um, presentation. And thank you to all of the Congress participants. Um, you're the stayers. <laughs> we had an enormous room full yesterday. We've got about half as many today. But you're the stayers. Thank you for hanging with us. Thanks for everything that all of you do in the community energy space and absolutely echo the sentiments about taking care of yourselves at the same time as taking care of your communities. Can we have all of the people that are part of the organising committee to join up here at the front, please?